Well, good day, everyone. Welcome to our riders or those considering the sport. If you're at the 110th or up north at the CRTC, welcome to you as well. You know what, wherever you're assigned, whatever that base may be, uh, thanks for joining us. My name is Master Sergeant Lance Houston. I'm assigned to the one, uh, 127th Wing Safety Office here on Selfridge Air National Guard Base. And I'm joined by Master Sergeant Joe Karatko, also uh, in the safety office here at the, the 127th Wing. This is the uh, Motorcycle Safety Annual Preseason Brief and Podcast. I tried looking for a longer name, Joe, but uh, they, they were all taken. Um, <laughs> Uh, if, you're, if you're a military on-road motorcycle rider, you're required to get this briefing, of course. Uh, and even if you're thinking about uh, joining, joining the sport or getting a motorcycle, I think this would be great for, uh, for you as well. Uh, Joe, uh, motorcycles are a great way to, to relieve the stress in your life. Uh, obviously, it's a, a one way to travel efficiently. And, and uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's also a nice way to witness nature, I think, as well, right? Something I fear some of us don't get enough of. So, uh, but two quick things before we get started. Uh, I get asked all the time about potential rewrites to, to AFI 91207. Uh, it's coming this summer. We should have something this fall. And then also, if you see that, that QR code in the upper right-hand uh, corner of the, the, of the slide we intend to, to show, that's a link to the Air Force Safety Center's uh, Department of the Air Force uh, Rider site, and it's full of motorcycle safety resources. We have guests. A little bit of research uh, uh, shows that uh, even just locally, we have folks that uh, like talking about motorcycles and, 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 and taking care of the military as well. I'll, I'll introduce each of those. But first, let me say, I think it's really cool that you guys were able to, to join us today to talk about motorcycle safety uh, and do that in a reputable, a reputable way. I say that because obviously you guys uh, ride in the performance of your duties, whether it's racing, patrolling, escorting, or otherwise. So uh, thank you uh, for joining us. Our first comes, uh, comes over from Sand Lake, Michigan. Uh, he's a super sport class rider and operates a nonprofit. Uh, that benefits the transitioning military members. Folks, please meet U.S. Navy veteran Tony Blackall of Blackall Racing. Welcome, yeah. Tony. <laughs> Thank you for yeah, having me. Yeah, you bet. Can you tell us just a little bit about yourself? Um, again, I'm Tony Blackall. I race in the Moto America series, which yeah. is the professional series in the United States. Um, Super Sport is the second to highest in the United States of racing. Um, basically, the adrenaline rush, the yeah. everything, just yeah. hot. Yeah. It's, uh, I want to go big. Yeah. Um, as in my nonprofit uh, happened when I come out of the military, I had some uh, struggles, some um, dark nights. And when I found motorcycles again, it brought me out. And once my wife realized that it brought me out because of the motorcycles, we figured out that we might be able to help someone else. And so that's where it really began. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, so, great. Uh, what did you do in the Navy, if you don't mind my asking? Uh, really nothing. Oh, really? You know, so uh, <laughs> to be honest, uh, my career ended before it even got started. Um, I was in for two years and all the way through training. Um, as I was in training, I ended up blowing my knee out. Oh, no kidding. So I ended up getting a med medically discharged. Okay, wow. So it was, uh, I came back pretty angry. Rough, yeah. So. Okay. Um, what do you ride? Uh, uh, leisurely or, or at the track? Strictly just the track. Yeah, okay. And what is that? Uh, Yamaha R6. Okay, gotcha. Uh, and maybe you could tell us a little bit about the team. I'm sure there's a lot of folks behind the scenes that uh, <laughs> help, <laughs> you guys, help you guys do what you do. Yeah, absolutely. So first and foremost, my wife, uh, she's a Marine veteran as well. Um, she loves the leadership roles. She does all the logistics. She does now she's even doing a little bit of the driving now, so mm -hmm. it's, you know, it gets my heart rate up before we get to the track. Right. <laughs> and then um, uh, behind the scenes, really, it's um, a lot of veterans that come together. I mean, That's cool. some that we've never even met before, but yeah. because of this outreach to be able to talk to the community and have others from another part of the United States where we travel to, brings them locally to us so that we can all get that camaraderie back. Yeah. Okay. So. Well, great. Uh, any high vis stuff? Are, are there, uh, uh, does, does Black All Racing have anything in store for us this year? Uh, we were talking a little bit prior to this and, and uh, it sounds like this may be your last year. Yep. Uh, I think I'm transitioning out. Yeah. Um, 
kind of going back to the family life, letting them grow up. Yeah. But um, high vis, we are going to go to the top tier of racing, which is the Superbike series, and kind of knock it off the bucket list yeah. and see if I can eat, get in and live the dream. Yeah, that's great. Well, welcome, Tony. Our next guest comes from uh, our backyard. Uh, uh, he's a deputy sheriff for the Macomb County Sheriff's Office and, and serves in the motor unit. Folks, please meet U.S. Marine Corps veteran uh, Jake Thorne. How you doing, sir? Hey, good. Yeah. Welcome. Uh, thanks for being with us. Maybe you could uh, tell us a little, bit about, a little bit about yourself. Yeah, I was uh, in the Marine Corps from 03 to 07. Uh, I was with the 2nd Battalion, 8th Marines, did a couple, three tours overseas. Yeah. Um, as soon as I came back, started at the Sheriff's Department within like six months. Uh, there, worked in the jail, moved on to road patrol. In the last five years, got on the motorcycle unit mm -hmm. where we do presidential escorts, special events all around the county, and yeah. it works out great. Yeah, a variety of things. Okay, great. And what do you ride? Uh, in Personally, I have a 2015 electric glide. Yeah. And then at work, we're just transitioning from 2012 electric glides to the new 1250 BMWs. Gotcha, yeah, real interesting. I saw the article on that, and uh, we intend to ask you more uh, about that transition, which is which is neat. Awesome, well, welcome to you both. Uh, thank you very much for, for being with us again. Our third guest will join us a, a bit later for our conversation on uh, personal protective equipment. His name is uh, Todd McNabney uh, with Heroic Racing Apparel. Uh, Todd's done some favors for me in the past, and um, he's going to chat more about modern protective equipment, of which I consider him an expert. Uh, we, of course, need our riders to dress for the slide. Todd knows how to do that and how to look good doing it, so uh, looking forward to that as well. Uh, Joe, we've got some great podcast names here. We've got Jake Thorne, <laughs> Tony Blackall, Todd like McNabney, to me. yeah, and, then there's, and then there's me, even you, even you right? Oh, hopefully. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Lance, Lance. We'll yeah. wing it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, lastly, uh, we have uh, Chaplain Pitt on the hook for a uh, blessing of the bikes, and that's going to happen immediately following uh, uh, trivia, actually, for those that so desire to continue listening. If you're not sure what blessing of the bikes is, that's an annual tradition in which uh, riders in some areas can join the chaplain in uh, invocation of safety for the coming riding season. So uh, anyway, these folks have agreed to be a resource for us, and we look forward to tran uh, uh, transmitting our conversation to uh, you uh, uh, on, you guessed it, the SharePoint. Um, now, I will tell you, um, there are some that ask why, right? Why do all this, uh, this stuff in the spirit of motorcycle safety when uh, drivers, riders, or otherwise, right, will make silly decisions? Uh, why expend all this energy doing this stuff? Um, uh, the answer is this. Uh, a lot of these mishaps were, were preventable, right? In the last five, uh, five years, the Air Force has had uh, 69 Class A motorcycle mishaps. Uh, that's enough people to staff our, our fire department Monday through Friday. Uh, of these mishaps, riders were hospitalized for 550 days uh, before leaving us or, or being discharged from the hospital. Speed uh, or other decision-making errors are, are almost always a factor in, in those cases. Uh, sometimes it's physiological, right? Alcohol or illicit drug. It could be a sensory misconception uh, or awareness. Uh, and yes, I think sometimes the organization has some influence on, on what happened as well. I think as a riding community, as, a, as an enterprise, um, as an organization, we, we should relieve ourselves of, of very little. So let me just extend one more thank you to our guests for, for joining us. Uh, you're choosing to be with us as evidence that I, th I think uh, that we're on the right track here. So uh, I'm sure, Jake, you feel a certain way about the Macomb County riding community. And I know, Tony, you feel very deeply about not just the riding community, but the military as well. So thank you. Yes. Uh, Tony, um, when you're out there on the track and something happens, happens, good or bad, um, do you folks just... Uh, accept that and move on or or is there some kind of um process for figuring out what happened and uh, to hopefully keep that from happening again i mean um yeah yeah absolutely we've, we've definitely had the negatives with the positives yeah. so when when the negatives if we've had let's say we're battling out there and we have a rider go down in front of us yeah we have to what's called target fixate 
So target fixate is a negative situation of when you're looking at that rider, bike, or situation, and you stare at it to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, you need to already get past it, move on, and keep going. Yeah. Um, now we've had other instances where we've had the wrong spacer on a rear tire, and it melted a cal caliper and lost all electronics, and it was dripping red hot, and the bike almost caught on fire. Wow. So we take that back after the practice or the qualifying. We all talk about it. We all see how everyone handled everything. And then we realign and go yeah. at it again. Yeah, you don't just relieve yourselves of any concern. There's this process for uh, figuring out what happened so you can hopefully keep it from happening again. Yeah, that's sure. great. Yeah. Uh, Jake, when we say law enforcement, uh, that sometimes elicits like reactive thoughts, right? Reactive things and uh, things of uh, reactive nature. But I'm sure the sheriff's office is engaged in lots of things that we would consider proactive. Is, are there any activities like that that uh, you folks are doing with the community? We uh, try to give as much information out there yeah. as we possibly can. You know, as much as everybody likes to get on a motorcycle and go fast, like we have to be very safety conscious of everybody on the roadway. Yeah. You have to watch 10 spaces ahead of you. You can't just watch the car in front of you because people always don't pay attention. Yeah. Cars drive cars, bikes, you put them together. If they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing, we can, we've had some really tragic accidents. Yeah, well, okay. Well, for those listening, we intend to show the raw numbers of uh, Air Force reportable motorcycle mishaps that have uh, happened since calendar year 2018. Um, these are all classes of mishap now. Between 2018 and 2022, the, the Air Force did see about a 13% decrease in mishaps, which is great. Uh, when I did pull these numbers, um, and I don't mean to laugh, but when I pulled these numbers about two weeks ago, we already had 25 cases in, in 2023. Okay. Uh, the next chart is, is total class A's and B's. We already indicated uh, the severity of a class A mishap. A class B would most likely be a permanent partial disability, right? These are cases where the rider recovered, um, but still had some kind of permanent impairment, right? The loss of an eye or a uh, finger, for example. Uh, 2019 was encouraging. Uh, but there, there was no dip in the COVID year necessarily, um, and, and it's not even April yet, and we already have four cases for 2023. Uh, again, when I say we, I mean the Air Force at large, right? Uh, so we'll, we'll re revisit this next spring to, to see how we fared, but if it's just Team Michigan uh, I'm, I'm, I'm talking to, let's, let's not lose sight of this, okay? Um, guys, required or, required or not, is motorcycle safety a... A responsibility. 100%. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it to each if rider. You live. Yes. If you want to live, yeah. yeah. Uh, each rider needs to know their boundaries and you got to take, I've learned as I got older, you got to take your ego out of it. Yeah. You, you can always learn something from somebody else. Mm -hmm. I, you know, when I got on the sheriff's motorcycle team, I was 33 years old, 34. I've already had mm -hmm. multiple motorcycles and when I had to take that expert class, I didn't know anything about motorcycles. Mm -hmm. And you can always learn, and the safety is of each rider. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. as adults, we should have this ability to, to be able to, I mean, I, I don't mean just motorcycle riders necessarily. As adults, we have to have this ability to, to self-assess, right? 100%. Yeah, whatever that, whatever that is, your skill, knowledge, uh, et cetera. Do either of you guys have kids? Yes. Yeah. I do not. You don't have kids, yeah. Uh, Tony, how do you think you're going to introduce your kids to, to motorcycles if you haven't already? So as soon as they come out and are part of this world, they've been a part of the motorcycle community. Yeah. So um, they go to the tracks, they experience everything. We do, we ride at home. Um, there's always engines starting up, yeah. getting ready uh, for winter, spring, summers. You know, they're always around it. Yeah, you name it. Yeah. I think part of my concern uh, for many of the Air Force's riders is is that uh, in the absence of someone uh, like a parent or, or responsible mentor, our riders, uh, uh, they don't get those little doses of respect that they might otherwise get from a responsible mentor, right? I think that's something we can probably say about a lot of things, right? And yeah, not just motorcycles, yeah. Uh, apart from operating safely, uh, uh, complying with the regulation, and having contact with your motorcycle safety representative, uh, military on-road motorcycle riders uh, need to do three things, right? Uh, they need an accurate must account. Uh, 
they need to get these briefings, including this one, uh, and they need training as well. Uh, uh, we're going to unpack uh, this some more, I think, in the slides that follow, but first I need to go back over one of the acronyms I just used, MUST. Uh, MUST is the Motorcycle Unit Safety Tracking Tool. I know that's beginning to sound an awful lot like uh, just one more system we're all expected to, one more database, one more system we're all just expected to know how to use. Um, but it's not hard, right? It, and even if you do have questions, you can contact your motorcycle safety representative, you can discuss that with another motorcycle rider, or you could call me, that would be totally fine. Um, you can find MUST by searching the Air Force portal, uh, or you can find it in the quick links under the safety section. Uh, strictly speaking, MUST is a module of AVSAS, that's the Air Force Safety Automated System, um, but that's not important. And real quick, if you're listening, you can probably follow along. Um, once you've created your account, entered contact information, including unit and indicated job function, which is going to be other, i.e. motorcycle rider, uh, you're going to submit a basic application. A user agreement window will appear. Uh, when you've checked all the boxes, hit the button that says continue to access. Uh, if you get an account validation warning, uh, don't panic. Simply use the validation links to correct your application. Um, that's where I think I'm going to leave you folks for now. Continue adding demographic information, including make, model, style of motorcycle, right? That's the fun part. Uh, and then creating a, a record to receive briefing or, or training credit is, is simple as well. If you have questions, again, contact someone or alternative, alternatively uh, use the tutorial that we keep on, uh, you guessed it, the SharePoint. Uh, Jake, how does, uh, how does the motor unit consider similar requirements? I mean, do you folks track training? Uh, conduct briefings. Are there? Is there someone that has like a safety representative like it's role? Ju it's just like the military. Yeah, really. Um, for the state of Michigan law enforcement, you have to do an 80-hour course, and it is a strict 80 hours, and it is grueling. And when you go there, this gentleman that puts it on says you're going to get strong because you drop that bike a lot. Yeah. Wow. And he teaches you a lot. And then as we go every year after that. We do training with ourselves in-house. Now that we're transitioning from Harleys to BMWs, we have to all go through another course. Yeah. And for one, I love it. Yeah. It keeps me on my toes. It, you know, you forget things and then they bring it back. So every year we train multiple times. Um, and I can, I just would encourage anybody if they're riding, there's um, places around that can take a course. Yeah. You know, it's they're not very expensive and. You can always learn something new. Of course, yeah. Always, always learning. Yeah, Tony. Uh, we have a we have some slides here dedicated to PPE already, uh, but I'm guessing you wear that when you're out there on the track. Yep. How how do the organizers of these events um, communicate that stuff to you? Uh, first and foremost, they always have a rule book. Everything that you need and want at the track. You know, everyone helps out. There's um, good places, social media to talk to other people if you're willing to actually ask. Um, but they actually enforce it. So we actually have to go through a tech inspection. So our bikes get teched and our gear gets teched. Mm -hmm. They want to make sure that nothing's cracked, scratched, or could injure ourselves. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, great. We'll come back to that, I think, when we start talking about inspections, repairs, maintenance, that sort of thing. But, um, well, great. I wanna, what I want to do now is transition, I think, um, uh, to, to risk. Uh, but first, a quick primer uh, on, on that. Nicky Lotta. Do you guys know who Nicky Lotta was? Famous Formula One race car driver. Yeah, he was an Austrian Formula One driver in the 70s and 80s. Uh, he was a driver's champion uh, several times and is the only driver in Formula One history to, to win that for just, uh, not just Ferrari, but McLaren as well. Uh, no, we're not here to talk about Formula One, uh, but I think Nicky Lotta uh, is pretty well known for, uh, in, in that community for being a, an advocate for, for risk management. Uh, and we intend to show a, a couple of direct quotes of, he, uh, of his on risk. Uh, now, the first is this, um, to make a decision, you need to be in a perfect environment. You, you need to be motivated by the right people, right? The second, I accept every time I get in my car, there is a 20% chance I could die and I, and I can live with that, but not 1% more. And the third, uh, if you're a straightforward racing driver, uh, you should always see your limits. You have to be objective and not come up with any stuff. Thoughts on that? I mean, 
I mean, that's accepting everything that you're <clears throat> yeah. stepping a part of. You're, you're, he's taking an accountability mm -hmm. to being respons responsible and respectable. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. Well, and just not knowing, he, I mean, he's right. You got to know your limits. Yeah. Don't Something. push past them. If you can't, you can't. Yeah. You can yeah. work your way to it, but don't go past them because yeah. that's when bad things happen. Yeah. Any other pearls of wisdom? Uh, that you guys subscribe to or, or other risk reminders that you've sort of set for yourself, um, whether it's at the track, in the street, on the job, or otherwise? Anyone? One one risk reminder for me is is the children. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Because I sit in the seat of irony being here right here today because those of Selfridge community know, know me from my younger life and how risky I was in everything that I did, right? And uh, I was in a motorcycle accident, laying on Mound Road, wondering if I was gonna die. Mm. So, but it was the thought of my daughter that made me realize that none of this is worth it. So that is my personal risk yeah. assessment yeah. now is family. Right, um, right. And to not live, to know your limits, yeah. as Jake said, yeah. and to do those risk assessments, say, is this worth it? Yeah. And not only hurting yourself, but hurting others if you do something stupid, take right. somebody else out with you. Yeah. Well, that's great, yeah. Um, Tony, you must, uh, I know you said you keep uh, uh, people on the team that, that help help you think straight. Um, how have they helped motivate or empower you to make risk decisions when you're, uh, when it's real time? You're, is, uh, you're, I, I'm guessing you're able to communicate with them to some degree. Wow. Um, when we're on track, the only way that we're allowed to talk is basically hand signals. Okay. So coming by everyone at 150 to 180 miles an hour, yeah, it's pretty quick. Yeah. But um, the thing is, when it is other veterans um, before the racing or anything like that, military, we kind of got this this talk or this look that we can see in each other's eyes. That kind of tells everything. Yeah. You know, when you sit back. Um, you were a complete stranger until you shook hands, talked, and then all of a sudden it just clicks. Wow. Uh, Jake is a deputy, a deputy um, on your bike or not. Um, I would suppose that it's not always easy to, to organize and assess the risks you're taking. Uh, certainly you don't have the luxury of getting to view things from afar like some of us, right? Uh, you're the man in the arena, so to speak. Um, assuming the sheriff's office helps communicate hazard information, uh, in real time, uh, what do you think the state of things would be if, if you didn't have folks that were advocating for your safety, right? You didn't have, uh, um, like, like uh, Nikki Lada tells us, uh, you have to be motivated by the right people. What do you think the state of things would be if... If I didn't have a good support from the Sheriff's Department, I mean, it would be a totally different world. Yeah. The support from our upper command and everything and giving us the tools how to do the job properly is hands down I wouldn't be able to do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Tony, it, it must be a stressful thing to, to compete at, at the level you want uh, and have the presence of mind to see your limits, process what's happening, uh, make a decision. Assuming you agree with Nikki, uh, Nikki Lada's comments uh, regarding limits, how are you able to to see the good and, and block the bad? I know that's a loaded question, but <laughs> how do you how do you do that? I mean, um, at my age and. Since this isn't my first rodeo, yeah. it's, it's kind of just like the risk versus reward, exactly what you're asking is, can I make this decision to pass this person on the inside safely where I'm thinking about his life and my life? And it just, it goes down to that is, and all that time it slows down and you're just trying to be as respectful and responsible as possible. Yeah, gotcha, yeah. I'm not saying that a risk decision means that you aren't able to compete at the level that you want to necessarily, but because surely the, the competitors out there are, are wrestling with the same risk reward stuff. Um, but uh, can you give us an example of a time when you, and maybe you did already some, you were able to push the envelope, so to speak, uh, even when faced, faced with this risk factor? Um, yeah, absolutely. So my local home track, Grattan Raceway, which yeah. we spoke about a little bit earlier, yeah. the, the pavement has been resurfaced, so it's gotten a little bit faster. So the bikes actually catch air going up over the hill, mm -hmm. or the hump is what it's called, is be uh, turn five. I had a situation with my rear tire that wanted to keep sliding on entry, but I, I felt comfortable and believed in the tire and my riding abilities. 
that I, I pushed a little bit farther and would just keep doing it yeah. and keep riding it. But it sounds like you were able to, to weigh uh, the risks uh, objectively, like Nikki yes. Lettuce says, and, and the, the outcome was positive. Absolutely. Yeah, great. I think that's a good segue to the decisions we might have to make uh, um, before, during, or, or, or uh, after we ride. Uh, it could be said that preparing to, to uh, make our risk decisions, uh, uh, I'm sorry, it could be said that when preparing to make our risk decisions, we have to have an approach, right? A rider has to be able to think inwardly about their situation, again, training, um, knowledge, skills, gear, route, hazards, uh, and certain myriad uh, examples that exist uh, for motorcycle riders. Um, I guess uh, I would liken that a little bit to, to baseball a little bit. I know that's strange, but it's my sport, right? Mm -hmm. When you're at the plate, you have to have an approach, right? Otherwise, you're not able to let in the good and, and block the bad, right? I'm not, Jake, I'm not saying that uh, as riders, we all need to be sports psychologists, but assuming um, knowing what you know and understanding that yes, there is a million and one variables out there for for motorcycle riders. Uh, can we afford not to have an approach? I mean, we have to be able to to do these things, right? No, you have to have an approach. You have to be able to see beyond. You know, we always focus on like cars, but we all ride in Michigan. You got to look for potholes. You know, debris in the roadway. You yeah. got to look for everything. There's a million variables out there. It's not just vehicles crashing into vehicles. Yeah, yeah. I've seen. I've rolled up on motorcycle accidents and there's no other car around. Yeah. And he hit a pothole and it literally just swallowed his tire. Wow. No. These are things we have to think about before, during, and after. Of right? course. Maybe it's, uh, these are things we, we enter into our own little captain's log and, and these are, this is information we can refer to year over year, ride, ride after ride, right? And uh, yeah, okay. Sort of collect these data points that we didn't previously have but now have and, and can refer to later. Yeah. Um, Jay, can you think of a time when, when you responded to a motorcycle event, maybe not a, necessarily a motorcycle event, and discovered a rider that was not thinking inwardly about these things? In other words, they were just they were just swinging away. 100%. It was on 26 Mile Road, just uh, west of County Line, and this uh, gentleman decided to run a red light on his Harley, and he didn't see, there was two lanes of travel, he didn't see the truck point out of the driveway. And his initial reaction was to put his foot up. Well, his foot went through the grill. And by the time we got there, me and my partner had to apply a tourniquet. Mm -hmm. And he, his, his lower uh, limb of his leg got ripped off. Wow. Wow. Um, Jake, obviously, it's not alarming uh, that your duties might sometimes make this decision an easy one for you. Uh, but good or bad, I know members of the motor unit have a small reputation for uh, all weather riding. Um, that's fair, right? Yes. That is very fair. Yeah. Okay, assuming that uh, there's there's always a risk decision making approach uh, to be to be had there. Uh, what factors are you guys considering? Um, we have a lot of variables. So like if we escort the president when he flies into Selfridge here, yeah, and we have to escort him. We have a split decision with the Secret Service when we're transporting him around. It, we have to look at the weather. If like halfway through the day. Like everybody wants to ride the motorcycle, but if halfway through the day we're gonna have downpours, we can't transport him safely. Yeah, right. You know, sometimes we don't get that lucky. The weather changes here in Michigan on a dime, yeah. and we just get caught in it and we deal with it and we try to deal with it as much as we can. Mm -hmm. I've been caught in the snow in November, and it's not the funnest thing. Um, but you, yeah, you have to definitely look ahead and see all your variables with the weather and everything. Yeah. If you if you're not a comfortable rider in the rain, don't ride in the rain. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Tony, at some point, I think we have to we have to ask ourselves, uh, am I riding for the right reasons? And, and, uh, and Joe, you talked a little bit about that uh, some already. Your situation is unique because um, you're participating in an activity that has some elevated level of risk, right? Uh, you're letting things like high speed cornering and braking into the mix. Uh, there, there may be some riders out there that believe um, the only way they can glean any kind of a uh, pleasure from riding is to, to do things similar to those uh, you do on the track, but in the street. Some of us may may feel that, perhaps most of us may feel that that's an example of riding for the wrong reason. What, what would you say to that person? Well, absolutely, that's riding for the wrong reason. I mean, there's a track for a reason, and then there's a street for a reason. Yeah. The street is to get from A to B safely, responsibly, and follow all the rules, or you gotta deal with 
Mr. Jake here. Yeah, right. So the track, you come out, you're safely, you have all your PPE gear, you, get, you, can, you can step up a little bit. Yeah. Um, I used to ride the street. Um, I was one of those guys, uh, I'll be honest. I was in sandals, a cutoff shirt, and riding, but now come to the track, I learned responsibility, and I learned like it was just unbeatable. Yeah. So now I strictly ride the track. Yeah. So. Okay. Guys, I've, I've listened to other riders say something along the lines of, uh, when you choose to ride, it's not a matter of if, but when. Have you heard that before? Absolutely. I don't know if you subscribe to that or not. Um, and I know that yes, we share the road with other cars and trucks, right? Then that that sometimes choose to make poor decisions. Um, should we accept that though? Should should that be our attitude? Should we be saying to our new riders, hey, you know, I, I know that you ride, but uh, eventually you're gonna be involved in a mishap, and and uh, it might be it may be severe. Sh should that be our attitudes, or should we be saying something more transformative? <laughs> I could, I could do devil's advocate okay, on this and okay. like go both ways where some people will respond to it and they'll actually think about it before they actually get on it and then others will take it as a negative decision and be pushed right away from the, the whole motorcycle scene. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Jake. No, I mean, as long as I've heard that since I started riding yeah. back when I was 18, I got my first street bike and I did lay it down, but it was always in the back of my head and I think... The reason why I laid my down, I wasn't experienced enough. I didn't take these extra yeah. steps to do these classes, and I thought, I'm 18, I'm in the Marine Corps, and I can live through anything. Well, yeah. when you lay a bike down at 70, it's pretty scary. Gotcha, yeah. All right, well, I think uh, we'll transition to, to inspections, uh, maintenance, uh, repairs, that sort of thing. It's spring, right? Spring is in the air. Um, uh, the first day of spring was over, over a week ago. Uh, riders are going to start pushing their bikes out of storage, right? Um, and uh, what we want to avoid here is a situation where um, someone is, is so anxious about getting out on that first good day uh, of spring that we forget about things like servicing, maintenance, uh, and repairs because uh, there's some things that can go wrong while our bikes are sitting in storage, right? Is that fair? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Tony, I'm sure the, the team uh, takes this pretty seriously throughout the year, but um, how does this change at the beginning of the season? Uh, basically, we do a completely complete bike teardown. Yeah. We start from scratch, build it all back up to just make sure everything's on par. Mm -hmm. um, and how much do you think of uh, how much do you think what you do at the track rod on that bike applies to the person that rides in the street? A hundred percent. Quite a hundred percent. Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, Jake, how does the motor unit? address servicing maintenance and repairs how does that every year it goes when we had the harleys they went to the local harley shop and they got gone through from front to back yeah we ride those things at high speed you know either going to crime trying to stop people sure and we have to have them working flawlessly mm -hmm. if they don't i could go down and that's just unacceptable right just because of a maintenance issue but they yeah. ours get done professionally every year yeah yeah um, guys, what, what sorts of things uh, can go wrong with our bike while it's overwintering, do you think? Well, one big thing is, you know, Michigan cold weather. Yeah. If you leave it in your garage and you just leave it on the cement, you get uh, wear spots on your tires. Yeah. If you don't have it up in there, I like to put carpet slabs underneath mine because it just sits there. Yeah. Um, I mean, check, your, check all your blinkers and everything, you know, moisture from the winter. Sure. You know, if you, unless you're keeping it in a perfect heated garage, yeah. you know, all that little things can go wrong and you might as well check everything before you take it out. Yeah. 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 The real big thing is little critters. Little critters. Little yeah. mice. Yeah. All of a sudden you'll have a perfectly clean bike and all of a sudden it won't start or the lights won't turn on because they chewed on some wires. Yeah. And they're, they're nesting and making a whole bunch of new little mice in, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> in, the, in the air filter Get or whatever. Get a going about 60 miles an hour yeah. and you got something running through. Oh, so. goodness. <laughs> Yikes. Okay. Um, is it true that, that, uh, um, properly prepping your bike for winter can, can avoid some of these, these negative or poor situations, mishaps, for example? Yeah. 100%. Yeah. 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 Um, what sort of things do you think uh, our riders may like to pay special attention, uh, special attention to this spring uh, so far as inspections, repair, or maintenance goes? I mean, if you have the ability, I just 
you know, I'm not a mechanic. Yeah. Sure. I'm, I'm mechanically inclined, but I take mine to my local guy. Yeah. I just yeah. have him go through it. Yeah. That way it's just a little bit, uh, my mind at ease. Cause it's not just me, Ryan. I take my wife with me Yeah. and I wouldn't be able to live with myself if, right. Because I wanted to save a couple bucks. Yeah. Something happened to both of us or even especially her. Yeah. Well, I don't think you're the exception at all. I think there's probably a lot of writers out there that aren't necessarily mechanically inclined and, and may omit, omit that step that mm -hmm. you take by taking your bike to, to get seen, right? By someone who is, yeah. Uh, br brakes, they strike me as uh, one of those things that he, I might want to pay special attention to. Uh, Tony, how, how important are brakes when you're out on the track? <laughs> uh, they're everything. They're, they're, yeah. it's, it, you want to be the fastest on the track, but you actually have to stop too. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, in the spring, uh, is there a battery of testing that you guys go through? You talked a little bit about that already to, to get the bike race ready. Yep. Um, are there some elements that are more important than others, would you say? Well, as previously stated, um, when we tear the bike all the way down and build it back up, we go down and we test at a track to make sure everything's on par. Yeah. Of course, we go through our lubricants, everything along those lines. But our biggest thing is not starting at 100%. To go 100 percent but we actually started at 60 percent and start yeah. ramping it up through the days yeah. we go we give the bike uh, a heat cycle make sure nothing's leaking then we hit the track and my maturity now <laughs> has me actually slow down and go ride and then pull myself off the track everyone goes through it everyone's okay with it it's the the four eye rule yeah you know um if i miss something my wife will usually pick it up mm -hmm. you know because she's always right yeah so yeah um, and when you when you prep a bike for spring, you tear it all the way down, yep. like you said, and then build it back up. But you don't do that between each race. Um, depends. Uh, if we have it in the budget, we'll do another um, engine. So it's 90% tore down. So then you're looking okay. at bushings, um, connectors, hoses, um, batteries even, and wiring. Because when those engines are being moved around so much and the vibrations at that kind of speed and those RPMs, um, we're always checking. Uh, torque specs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I guess what I was getting at with that question was like, so each race is like a new spring for you for Absolutely. the for the for the homebody street right. rider, yep. lace, lace person. Yeah, that spring once a year. Yep. But your spring is every race. Yep. And that that's actually transferred into my everyday life because every time I go to get in a vehicle, I always look at the tires. Yeah. You know, um, maybe once a week I'll look at my oil, um, and I'll just check everything out. You know, it, it's simple. Simple things. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Jake, you and I were were uh, chatting earlier, and I know that the motor unit did just transition from the Harley Davidson to the BMW. Um, can you can you tell us a little bit about that and what maybe motivated the change? Uh, just with um, everything around here, it's yeah. not just a couple cars. We live in a big metro area now. It's growing as at a exponential rate right mm -hmm, now, mm -hmm. and the we've as a group come together test drove the bmws and for performance for us safety everything that's the direction we went yeah there's nothing against harley's my personal bikes are harley i will never get rid of it sure. i love it but i'm at being a police officer it's a lot more high intensity sure. you know i have to be able to move very quickly you know when we escort the president like i've said that's a very fast pace situation mm -hmm. if i'm trying to run to a call to save somebody's life it's happened you know lights and sirens i got to get there quickly and safely and the bmw right now they've changed a lot of things in their repertoire and it's made it a lot safer for us gotcha. yeah. there's nothing against harley i don't want anybody to get mad at me <laughs> right right of course <laughs> but, yeah, uh, well, yeah it, ju it just works better for yeah. us well it's entirely possible that that some of our riders are still getting around on their their dad's 1993 sportster right? of course yeah. All right. Are there things, design features uh, that the BMW has that these folks really ought to consider moving to? I mean, I mean the BMW for safety is it's 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 crazy what that bike can do yeah. compared to like the, your your Harleys are your Harleys. They're sure. they're motorcycles. They're big. They're cruisers. They're fast. Um, where the safety in this BMW, I mean, they have a, like a lean protection. As soon as this thing leans too far, like it, it vibrates and tells you, like if you lean any more, this bike's going down. Yeah, and they have anti-lock brake braking have, systems. Not to yeah, say I the mean, Harley yeah, they got ABS and all that, but I mean, it's just it, that thing's a computer on wheels. Wow. Yeah. You can literally link any like there's apps in there that they can link for safety. I mean, you can 
control the bike, you can only let it go so fast. Like you can control everything if somebody else wants to ride it, which we don't let anybody ride our bikes. But <laughs> yeah, I mean, the safety on these things are just going through the roof. Wow, yeah, well, that's great. Um, Jake, you've had to have seen some PPE doozies out there <laughs> in the world. Have you have you uh, seen any serious lapses in uh, judgment when it comes to, to personal protective equipment? 100%. Um, again, like I said in the beginning, I was 18 years old, I was yeah. in the Marines. You know, when I was on Camp Lejeune, you had to wear, you know, reflective vests. You had to make sure you wear your helmet, your gloves, all that. And I will be the first to say when I got off that base, I was like, ah, I don't need all this. And I took it off. And as I went into this line of work and I've seen people ride, like Tony said, he used to ride without boots and wore sandals. <laughs> when I see that, I cringe. Cause I've seen people go down with, you know, just shirts on. Yeah. Um, no helmets. Mm -hmm. I've seen some horrific accidents that could have been avoided if they just wore the proper gear. Yeah. Okay. And we all live in the state of Michigan. Um, I think I know the answer to this, but if I ride a motorcycle, should I wear a helmet? 100%. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's just, it blows my mind that they pass that law and it's everybody's right to do whatever sure. they want. Sure. But I would say just in the situations I've been in, I've seen people walk away from horrific accidents that wore helmets mm -hmm. that were DOT certified and everything. And I've watched people not walk away from accidents where I had to go tell their parents, you know, that your son's not coming home tonight. Well, and I know I won't tell them, but I know it's because they weren't wearing a helmet. Yeah. Well, I think I, I asked my question in, in terms uh, intended to persuade, but uh, yes, if you're a military motorcycle rider, you need to wear a helmet. Uh, without unpacking every everything, your helmet must have a DOT approved sticker, right? Or uh, a serialized Snell Memorial Foundation sticker or uh, M2010 or higher. Uh, or a, other label recognized by DODI 6055.4. Full-faced helmets preferred, of course. Mm -hmm. um, I think if you're not wearing a certified helmet, maybe you're wearing one of those novelty helmets, right? Mm -hmm. you, we can't guarantee that your helmet has passed all the testing that these things go through, right? I think it's uh, impact, penetration, and, and then the retention test as well to, to be sure that you're your helmet isn't going anywhere. 100%. I've seen yeah. these novelty helmets and I can literally grab them and just squish them with my own hands. Yeah, and yeah. wow. It's like, that's not really gonna do that much. Gotcha. Uh, Tony, what kind of helmet do you wear on the track? I wear KYTs. Yeah, and that's comfortable? Absolutely. Yeah. And if I can take just a second on, uh, just going to the shop and fitting a helmet, don't just get one that fits you. Talk to someone that actually knows something about it Yeah. because it may feel like it fits you, mm -hmm. but if it doesn't properly fit you, it can move around and still be just as damaged. Yeah, so so over the years you've developed a preference for this, yeah. this style of helmet, yeah. I think there's a part of me that wants to pull a, a concept over from the workplace safety world, which is that if the PPE isn't comfortable, right? Yeah, sometimes if it's not even, if it's just unattractive, the person isn't, is less likely to wear it. Uh, do you think that's true? I mean, one hundred percent. I mean, that, that was what it was when I was younger. Yeah, sure. But you know what? Like I said, as I got older, it just I I can't stress enough to wear it. Yeah. It it, it is. These people don't on the roadway as I see. Yeah. As an officer, I can literally ride my motorcycle. I've ridden next to people that are texting and driving. Don't even know I'm there. I've literally knocked on their windows as yeah. I'm riding next to them. Wow. And it's you know it. Those bright colors, they do help. Yeah. You can see people a lot longer longer distances. Yeah. And I can't stress enough how much I would just recommend everybody to wear all that. Yeah, okay. I think what we'll do now is bring in our friend uh, Todd McNabney from Heroic Racing Apparel. Uh, Todd's a super nice guy and, and knows a thing or two about dressing for the slide. Uh, good afternoon, Todd. Hi there, guys. Good, hey there. good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, Todd, I wonder if, uh, uh, well, first, I'm with uh, two other guys, um, Tony Blackall of Blackall Racing and, and uh, Deputy Thorne, uh, Jake Thorne of the local sheriff's office. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and, and how you got started in this business? Sure. I, uh, I started this business in 2006. I was actually in the IT industry, traveling all over the world and, and uh, teaching people how to ride. And I was riding on the street and, and instructing people on track days. And at the time, not very long ago, 
suits were straight up and down, and there wasn't really a lot of equipment in the industry. And so at, at that time, Joe Rocket was, was already making a name. Icon was just getting ready to come into the industry on the, on the classy b- bottom end, I guess, for street. And uh, there was a lot of the, the old school brands were making straight up and down products. And I wanted to make something that, A, is simple. You know, our tagline's fit, focus, and function. And the product has to fit in order for you to focus. And if you can't focus, you can't function. Yeah. And so it's kind of the recipe, whether it be in a street hoodie, and that hoodie will slide 85 feet, or a glove, our gloves will slide 400 feet, or a suit, and our suits are designed to feel transparent. In. <laughs> um, you and I have uh, met before, and I've had a chance to listen to you speak. Um, it does seem like there's a fair amount of appetite at our location for... Um, I was going to say contemporary, but modern protective equipment. No unfair advertising and, or endorsement intended here, but I count you, I, I count you among the, those sources of, of people that uh, seem to be filling this need. Can you, can you tell us a little bit uh, about how Heroic um, is protecting the street rider? Well, we're just trying to offer simplicity. And, and my main focus uh, uh, from the get-go with racing and we were at, at the races, and I realized, well, people that are coming to watch are street riders. And so I, I was, I was one of the first ones that came up with a, a, an armored hoodie. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to make something that, uh, look, everybody's got a friend that's got hurt on the street, and it breaks your heart. And if you could, you know, one of the stunt, stunters that I, I uh, sponsor. Just hit, it hit me up two nights ago, and he said, "Buddy, he said I got good news and bad news." The good news is your gear saved my skin from a 75 mile an hour slide. And he said the 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 bad news is I'm going to need a uh, I'm going to need a, a new product because it's, it's not good for representation. <laughs> <laughs> but but that's the biggest thing is is keeping people's skin safe and help, and help them look good, but also be able to take fit out of the equation so you can really focus on that that little time that we get to ride. Yeah. Well, I'm going to uh, ask you about a, uh, ask you about a specific component here. I don't know if if there's if there's anything uh, more uncomfortable, or, or I don't know if there's anything that can can be more uncomfortable than the trousers that military on road riders have to have to wear. Is there a line of trousers out there? I know it's odd uh, that has all the things we wish for. You know, it's de- it looks decent. It's breathable, light. Uh, it protects us in the way we need it to. <laughs> We are actually, uh, I just took over Bolster USA, and Bolster is a jean from Paris, and it's regarded, as, and it's not just regarded, as the uh, certifications are, it's the strongest denim in the world, and uh, they have, you know, just the, ju- just the, the their, their high-end abrasion-resistant uh, mm-hmm. material, that, that uh, jean by itself will slide 120 feet before your skin gets burnt. <laughs> and, and then on top of that, they have uh, models where they have very, very thin, uh, almost, it's very similar to D3O, where it's a reactive uh, urethane that uh, heats up and uh, really protects your joints. And so we are working on, on uh, building that right now. And so that's, it's, I've, got, I've got samples that we're out on the road with, but uh, it's hard to, to build a company. <laughs> We're working on it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how about the full fingered gloves? Um, here in Michigan, we have all four seasons, right? Uh, it, it, are there are there warm and, and cold weather gloves available to, to riders? At, at Heroic, we really only have uh, you know three seasons: spring, summer, fall. And the reason is is because we specialize in race gloves, and then our street gloves are derivative of the race gloves. So we try to make them. I've even got a camouflage version where we we uh, cover the knuckle for the Indian and Harley guys, so they look like they're actually getting the same glove that my uh, super motard or or a flat track racers are getting. Also, when you're going down the road, spread your fingers, and it's like an air conditioner all the way to your armpit. Interesting. But uh, you know, I recommend if you're looking for a, a warm weather glove, go to a brand that really specializes in that kind of gear, yeah. and you're getting something special. Yeah. Okay. Well, my next question, I think, is for the group. Um, 
I've heard that neglecting to, to wear your PPE uh, properly would be almost like not wearing it at all. Is there some truth to that? Absolutely. You know, I I make armored hoodies. You know, I was the first I was the first brand uh, when I started making up in 2012. The industry started making them in 2015. Mm-hmm. In 2017, Alpine Stars entered the the uh, abrasion resistant uh, gear. So I've been doing this for a long time as far as the street stuff. And uh, I had a, uh, like I was saying earlier, I had a, my stunter called, wrecked 75 miles an hour in our hoodie, and it just had holes on the exterior on the cotton part. There was no abrasion, no whatnot. So the biggest thing, you know, we really recommend uh, that street safety because your skin is so important. It's, it's uh, yeah, it can heal, but if we don't even get you in that scenario, you just, you just got a great story. Yeah. Um, perhaps uh, this is all. I mean, perhaps that's that's more true of the, the airbag vest than anything. And I mean, right, properly wearing your PPE. The airbag vest is something the Air Force is starting to advocate uh, uh, for more as as that next level of, of PPE. Do you do you have any experience with these at all, Todd? Now we make uh, we 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 generally recommend that customers uh, purchase one of the Alpine Stars products, one of our competitors. And what we do is they they have a solution for pretty much every type of rider, whether it's the uh, Tech Air 3, 5, 10, or the race. Yeah. And uh, each one of those has a saving grace. You know, we I actually uh, worked with a uh, brand out of, I don't even know where they're out of, but, uh, you know, just to relocate the breeds of that product. But really, when you're wearing an airbag suit, an airbag product, if so, something I really... Uh, encourage people to look out for is you don't want that canister at your ribs because uh, whether it's a tuck and roll or whether you get hit from the side, if you get hit, if you run that canister into your ribs, you're going to get hurt. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, you know, be very careful what airbag products you wear, uh, you purchase. Yeah. Uh, the other side is also, you know, I really recommend that if you're buying a suit or a jacket, really make sure that it's ruby. Because when that product goes off, I, I have tons of people that buy products over the counter from dealers, and the dealers try to put them into a product that fits like Valentino Rossi. And oftentimes, that product doesn't have room, room for the airbag to go off, hmm. and the guys get hurt. Yeah, that's a good point. And, and so there are so many different criteria. Honestly, if, if a guy was big for buck, we have D three O level two armor, and I could you could jump out of a second story window with this stuff. And uh, I just the reason why I'm late to the beating here is we just re- received our pallet for the spring, yeah. <laughs> so just, we do a lot of that, and it's amazing, yeah. amazing, clear, amazing not, stuff. Just to be clear, we're not uh, advocating that folks jump out of a two story uh, window, right? <laughs> well, you guys did crazy stuff already, so I mean, I I, I think you guys are are. are Cream for the <laughs> uh, Tony. Uh, how have these these airbag vests been uh, received in the in the racing world? I mean, uh, um, are they are you guys using the, the tethered system? Is it like a wireless type of? <clears throat> so some riders are wearing the tethered. Um, the others are what Todd was speaking of, the Alpine Stars one. Yeah, yeah. Where they're amazing. I've I've actually got to test one. Yeah. Not willingly, but right. I got to test one, and it, it saved me. I jumped right up, looked like the Marshmallow Man for about thirty seconds. Yeah. And uh, was good to go. Yeah. Well. Um, PPE can be expensive, right? Um, but I feel like having it is as integral to to riding a, a, as the bike is. My feeling is that if you're not able to, and maybe you guys don't feel the the same way, but my feeling is is that if you're not able to afford things like personal protective equipment training, servicing, maintenance, or repair, then then riding, riding probably isn't a sport for you. Do you guys feel the same way? Yes. I mean, so these, yes. these are all um, uncompromising parts of, of being a rider. Do you feel the same way, Todd? Absolutely. It's, uh, it's an expensive sport, and uh, really that's the reason. Why, you know, I, I used to ride six days a week on the racetrack, and there's always, there was always somebody open. But uh, when it comes down to it, and you get a little older, you start realizing what uh, what the value of a time to be able to work and also uh, responsibility, mm-hmm. and uh, and also you know can I afford to to have proper gear to be able to do this? Whether that's tires, and 
you know, tires are a, are a big factor as well. And that's not the topic, but uh, there's so many variables that are expensive in the sport. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, what I can tell you is is that when an, an employer, and, and you know that I'm in the workplace safety game as well, uh, when an employer takes fiery exception with, with OSHA, since they aren't sometimes able to afford compliance, whatever form that takes, OSHA will tell them that uh, straight up they're in the wrong business, right? Or that they're in over their head um, because there is no conversation, like I said. Um, and like we've been talking about, safety is an, un an uncompromising part of riding just as fall protection is for the part-time roofer. Um, I can see where that might be a tough pill to, to swallow for, for some riders, but uh, um, mishaps don't just happen, right? They're, they're caused and um, sometimes the cost of doing business uh, motivates people to do the, do the wrong thing, make the wrong choice, and, and that can be deadly. Um, all that being said, and again, no unfair um, promotion or endorsement intended here, but for those military riders in the Selfridge area, uh, you get 10% off your purchase um, at Macomb Power Sports and Spartan Cycle. Uh, if you decide to join the Loyalty Rewards Program, Wolverine Harley-Davidson does uh, double points instead of one on products purchased at their location. Uh, all three of these locations, folks, are within three miles of the main gate. Um, Todd, uh, <laughs> Heroic doesn't do anything for, for military, do you? Well, it depends on what the pro product is. Um, definitely with our race suits, I get always give 10% off military discount. You know, to me, uh, being Heroic is more than just anything related to racing. It's it's actual, it's a, it's a pill for life, you know. Yeah. And so, you know, people that are, are military, I tell you what, those are the most heroic people that I could like. It. And so we definitely want to give you 10% off. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I think we're going to move on, Todd. I, I do really appreciate your time. Thanks for joining us. Uh, I know you care deeply about the riding world, and, and, and so we do appreciate your comments. Um, uh, we'd love to have you on again sometime. Thank you guys very much. All right. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Uh, guys, I think uh, one of the things I've come to know about motorcycle safety is, is that nothing uh, can take the place of good judgment, right? Good, uh, real-time decision-making. Speed, for example, seems to produce uh, way more negative effect than failing to have your must account, for example. Um, that being said, I think when you've decided to accept uh, good decision-making into your riding life, which for some can take longer than, than others, um, I think you're ready to improve your skill at that point. Um, but uh, uh, there is quite a lot uh, to think about, I think, uh, and when, it, when it comes to ways to improve uh, your riding, your right. Um, and we're going to talk briefly about the Air Force's continuum for training. Uh, there's going, stopping, cornering, braking, right positioning, just to name a few. Uh, Tony, I'm guessing uh, even someone like yourself uh, has to do a lot of inventorying of your skills, right? Riding proficiency. Is this something you go through annually? Do you have some kind of routine, right? I know uh, professional sports players, football or otherwise, they stretch out on the field. Is there things you do uh, prior to prior to the race uh, when it comes to skill or? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I definitely, the first step is I always go out and look at the bike. It just puts my mind at ease. And then I'll go into my next step, which is stretching out, warming up. Yeah. Um, I even like to do like a quick run to get a sweat in because my mindset gets focused. Mm -hmm. I'm out there by myself. It's almost like I'm riding and it just wakes me right up. Yeah. Uh, and these are perishable skills, right? I mean, we always have to be working on, working on our, our craft, right? That's, is that fair? Yep. Yeah. Um, I think one of the things we like to ask about training in the military is, is, is this one time or do I have to come back? Right? Do I have to come back uh, uh, next quarter, next year? Um, when it comes to motorcycle safety, you have to be thinking about these things all the time. Is that, is that true? Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. keep your skills yeah. going. Yeah. Um, Jake, is there something uh, you're always practicing on your bike? Yeah, like a lot of our stuff is slow skill stuff. Mm -hmm. So even when I'm at my house, I yeah. have a like a pad that's just a little bit smaller than what we train on. Yeah. So I actually will, uh, every time I come out, even on my personal bike, I'll just make sure I can still do the figure eights and everything, the stopping, the braking, you know, test everything out before I take it out with my wife and yeah. we go for a nice ride. Yeah. Um, I don't mean to put you on the spot here, but uh, there may be a listener out there that's, that's wondering if... Uh, 
whether or not a deputy like yourself might might take exception with somebody practicing their corner cornering swerving at low speeds in a vacant lot or or similar I've, I've seen people do it yeah even when i'm working yeah. like if i go past the high school the high school has a good like their handicap uh, posts mm -hmm, mm -hmm. are perfect for a figure eight to practice. Yeah, and it's they're tight, you know. And you'll see you'll see me on my motorcycle in the high school parking lot in the summer. Yeah, doing that when no one's around. Yeah, um, have I, either of you been involved in a mishap or accident, wh whichever you prefer, uh, where mm, you know maybe if I had to practice my swerving or cornering a bit more, I'm, I could have prevented that. One hundred percent. Yeah, I had a Gixxer six hundred. When I was uh, in the service, yeah, and I was on the back roads of North Carolina, I was a very inexperienced rider, yeah. and I came into a curve way too fast, mm -hmm. and ended up shooting me out into a cornfield. Yeah. Um, in your opinion, are there other things that uh, that a rider should be thinking about? Maybe not just those, but others at all. Anything stick out? You got to take everything into a factor. Yeah, yeah. You got to be thinking about what that car ten cars ahead of you is doing. You gotta watch the roadway, especially in Michigan potholes. Yeah. Like I said, yeah. you know, and there's you just you have to be a very vigilant rider nowadays. Mm -hmm. yes. mm -hmm. Well, so regarding the Air Force's continuum of training, um, there's some emphasis on having the right training at the right time for the right bike. There are three very general levels of training that our riders need to take care of. Uh, their initial, intermediate, and then their sustainment training, sometimes called refresher. Uh, if you've completed initial training or if you're already endorsed, uh, you don't get to stop thinking about these things. You still need an intermediate level of training within one year, preferably six months. Uh, if you're a sport bike rider, i.e. you ride a bike, optimized for speed, acceleration, braking, and cornering on paved roads, typically with a front fork rack uh, below 30 degrees, then you require sport bike focused training to satisfy uh, that intermediate level of training. Uh, this includes any motorcycle where the foot pegs are, are located behind the operator's center of gravity or the manufacturer uh, classifies it or advertises it as a sport bike. Uh, and then every, th every five years after that, you need that sustainment training because once again, this, these are perishable skills we're talking about. Um, uh, these are some of the, uh, the training classes available to our riders this year. Uh, we already have 12 attending the, the Advanced Riders course on 13 May. Uh, there are other reimbursable training sources as well. Um, Jake, I know you talked a little bit about this already some, but can you tell us about some of the training the motor, motor unit uh, requires or subscribes to? Yeah, so we do, it's a Midwest training. They actually mm -hmm. do police and civilian. Mm -hmm. They're out of Troy and uh, his police uh, motorcycle course is very intense. Yeah. It, I mean, it has a, a uh, 45 percent fail rate so when we all went in there we thought one of us was going down and he said actually out of our six that went we were the first class that all of us passed wow. he, you know he's he's not he told us he's not going to pass us if he thinks we can't do the job and because yeah. it's then putting liability on him and he couldn't live with that yeah okay. uh, it's it's a very high intense training and i mean you gotta remember you got something between your legs that's you know probably a couple hundred pounds to, like the bikes that we rode for work were almost 780 pounds. Yeah. It's a lot of weight to be pushing around. Yeah. Mm. Um, <clears throat> Tony, I think what we'll do here is, is uh, uh, talk briefly about motorcycle mentorship. Um, but this may be a great time for you to tell us a little bit about Tango Romeo, if, if you think that's, if that's, if that's okay. Uh, can, you, yeah. can you share us a little bit more about, about that? So our Tango Romeo is the nonprofit that we are developing and bringing out to help and our future outlook on it is having bikes available to bring the bring veterans in um, police officers ambulance emts every everybody that's been in kind of a stressful lifestyle and it's kind of we lose a lot of our friends that have also been in that situation so meeting strangers that have been there done that and the camaraderie comes right back is what Tango Romeo is all about. Is and that's all we want to do is just we're we're trying to bring that community back together. That way, everyone knows that there's still someone out there for them. Yeah, well, that's great. Um, so I don't ride, um, but one of the things I know about motorcycle riders, and, and this isn't unusual, right, is that they like to associate with other people that like motorcycles, right? That's not weird at all. <laughs> um, so knowing that and, and how hard it is sometimes to um, 
uh, reach people uh, of all different statuses in the military off duty. Uh, we're going to try a program for putting members of the wing, the installation, in touch with other riders uh, here at Selfridge that have a respect for the road, a respect for the machine, a respect for the standard required of all military members, and, and, and maybe more, most importantly, a respect for themselves. Um, so if you're interested in that, and I certainly hope that you are, uh, we have incentives for airman-led safety activities like this. Um, there's going to be an avenue here for satisfying our five-year refresher training, of course, as well. Mentors need only follow um, the link to the Air Force's, uh, I'm sorry, the Air Force Safety Center's DAF rider site using the QR code once again in the upper right hand corner to, to locate any three of those 36 modules, mentorship modules available for accomplishing refresher training. Um, but there's going to be, uh, I think, an, an opportunity this year to participate in group rides and, and different things. But uh, um, also, if you take a photo with, with you and a mentor or with you and a mentee this year and and uh, tag the 127th wing on Facebook or Instagram. Use hashtag WeRideReady23. Uh, you're automatically entered to win our photo contest, uh, which ends at 8 p.m. On, on Labor Day. Okay. Uh, Jake, um, as a deputy that's seen some stuff, uh, are we right to place some emphasis on encouraging our riders to, to associate with other people that have, once again, have respect for all those things? Oh, 100%, because yeah. when you associate with people, I mean, that do the the sport, you know. You can find some older uh, enthusiasts, and they can. You'll learn something. You always yeah. learn something from yeah. somebody else. Yeah. Um, well, I, I recently picked up a hobby, and uh, I'm not going to bore you with the details of that. But one of the things this community will tell you, uh, if you're new, a newcomer, is that uh, you really need a mentor before getting serious about this. Um, in your guys' opinion, I mean, is motorcycle, motorcycling, riding motorcycles one of those activities where you really ought to have a mentor, a responsible mentor to discuss things like safety with? Yeah. That's, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah I was going to say, like, when going back to starting back at 60% at the beginning of the year, yeah. just having someone hold you back, don't go all in, slow it down, and yeah. learn. Yeah. Um, and have either of you ever had a, a motorcycle mentor? Yeah, once yeah. I once I started meeting the community um, and we started riding, um, it wasn't necessarily on the street where I met my mentor, but it's more on the track. Yeah, yeah. How about mentees? Have you ever had a uh, someone that you would consider a mentee in the in the way? Oh of yeah, yeah. I, I feel like after I've gone through a lot more training, yeah. like a lot of guys ask me when we go. Like we go on long rides. Yeah. Like we went up to Copper Harbor last year, and I had a bunch of other police officers with me mm -hmm. that aren't part of the motor unit, and I just gave them some tidbits. You yeah. know, you do this, you do this. And they're like, oh man, that really helped me out yeah. a lot. Yeah. What kind of tidbits? If you, so I mean, like braking. braking For some yeah. reason, like I didn't know when I had that crotch rocket. I mean, he knows. I didn't know that you use the front brake more than the rear brake. Yeah. That's a that that was day one stuff, but I didn't know because you know back then I was. I didn't need to know. Mm -hmm. And I found out the hard way when I slammed on that rear brake at 60 miles an hour and yeah. that rear tail almost came out from underneath me till I let go of it. Yeah. Okay, well great. And you were talking, Tony, that um, your son is learning to ride, right? Yep. So one of your newest mentees. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> what are you teaching him? Um, basically the fundamentals. Um, it, it starts like, how do you start the bike? And before we even start the bike, I ask him where every brake is. And he points out to the brakes, we move on. So how does the bike go? He shows me the throttle. How does the bike turn off? He shows me the kill switch. So we, we just start off with the basics, and then once he builds up that muscle memory, we start to move on. And PPE? Uh, yes, <laughs> way better than mine. <laughs> we have all the gear. It basically looks like I'm, I'm that overprotective parent where he's like out there in bubble wrap, basically. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so. Well, as if uh, it were possible to need more incentive, uh, for listening to the podcast, it, it's time for trivia. Um, if I had a sound effects board, right, I might use the most dramatic of these. Uh, now, I, I know you guys didn't uh, cut your teeth um, in the Air Force, but yes, it's common to, to end our meetings with a bit of light trivia. So, uh -oh. um, yeah, anyway, the rules are simple. Um, I'm going to ask you guys uh, 10 multiple choice questions. The guests correctly answering the most questions will be crowned. The 2023 undisputed buzzkill of motorcycle <laughs> knowledge. Okay. All, all other desirable titles were, were taken. Um, also, uh, no striking of the hair or face. Okay. Do you, uh, do you gentlemen understand the rules as I have just read them to you? Yes. Okay. 
Question number one, and you guys have the questions in front of you. Yep. Uh, go ahead and grab those. Joe will be recording your answers. <laughs> no oh cheating boy. going no on. Cheating. Oh man. <laughs> no goosenecking, yeah, right. <laughs> um, question number one. Uh, oh, oh, that's geez. right. <laughs> when was the first internal combustion motorcycle fueled by petroleum invented? Was it A, 1885, B, 1900, or was it C, 1915? Do you want to just answer? What do you think, Jake? I'm going to say C. C? I'm going to go with A. A? The answer. Oh, why? The answer. A, 1885. That's all luck. Yeah. Dang it. <laughs> I mean, I'm, uh, I'm old. I'm not that old. In 1885, Gottlieb Daimler patented what is generally considered to be the first true motorcycle. <laughs> However, the idea of a motor-driven two-wheel vehicle did not originate with Daimler, nor was his the first to see the road. Sylvester Roper, who spent the U.S. Civil War working in a Union armory, uh, built a primitive motorcycle as early as, I'm sorry, 1867. Some argue that Roper should, have, should be credited with, with building the first motorcycle. However, what gives credibility to Daimler's uh, claim is that his was gasoline driven. Roper's post-war bike was powered by steam. <laughs> Question two. We got nine more to go. I'm gonna say C. <laughs> Uh, by the time uh, World War One broke out, oh. which which country was the largest manufacturer of motorcycles? I want to say C, Germany. Was it A, the USA, B, India, or was it C, Germany? C. <laughs> We're both wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Answer, uh, B, India. Oh, that was good, That's right. Uh, by the time World War I broke out, India was the largest manufacturer of motorcycles. India has traded this title with China over the years. One major reason for India's success with motorcycles is residents' attitude towards them. Uh, Ameri in America, motorcycles are viewed as little more than toys, not everyday modes of transportation, but in India, it's just the opposite. A small motorcycle may uh, be the only transportation many people in India have. Uh, this was also the case in China, the previous top motorcycle producer, uh, but the Chinese government has banned motorcycles in some city centers uh, and provided incentives for using electric uh, bicycles instead, uh, causing their domestic motorcycle market to decline. Question number three. Uh, which of the following models was the first motorcycle designed with an anti-lock braking system? Was it A, the BMW K-Bike, B, the Suzuki Cavalcade, I'm gonna mispronounce that, or was it C, the Honda Goldwing? I'm gonna go with C. C? Uh, yeah, Honda's I, been on top of things. Honda, yeah. The answer, the BMW K-Bike. Oh, come on. <laughs> uh, in 1988, this is going great. 1988, <laughs> BMW introduced the first motorcycle with an electro-hydraulic ABS, the BMW K100. Yamaha was the next to enter the ABS game in 1991. Honda got on board in 1992. It took Harley Davidson another 13 years before they offered ABS on police models, as it so happens. And then Suzuki f finally launched their first bike with ABS in 2007. How'd you come up with all these questions? Oh, it's a uh, yeah, long, unbo uh, boring, uninteresting process. Just off the top of your head. Yeah, I have a, a, right? a variety of books at home under uh, on top of the fireplace. Anyway, uh, question number four. <laughs> Um, full closure fairings were banned from professional motorcycle races in 1958 by the International Motorcycling Federation for what re reason? Was it A, political matters, B, safety concerns, or was it C, patent issues? I'm going to say, even though he's the racer, I'm going to say B. I was going to go with B as just well. Just because I was just yeah. thinking it would be one more thing that come yeah. off the bike. Right, right. Yep. A good choice. The answer B. Yes. Hey. Safety concerns. <laughs> <We're back. laughs> on the board. <laughs> a single piece streamlined shell covering the front half of a motorcycle, resembling the nose of an aircraft actually. Sometimes referred to as a torpedo fairing, it dramatically reduced the frontal drag, but it was banned by International Mo I'm sorry, it was banned by the International Motorcycling Federation uh, from racing in 1958 because it was thought that the wind pressure made them highly unstable. Other seasons, uh, I'm sorry, other reasons cited for the ban were to ensure adequate steering range and stability in crosswinds. Question number five. <laughs> Halfway. Uh, in 1894, uh, which model became the first series production motorcycle? Was it A, the Orient Aster, 
B, Hildebrandt and Wolfmuller? Or was it C, the P Peugeot motorcycle? Am I saying that right, Peugeot? Your guess is <laughs> as good yeah, as mine. I'm gonna say A. All right, then I'm gonna go with B. All right. I haven't heard of <laughs> the answer, B. Hildebrandt and Wolfmuller, yep. <laughs> The Hildebrand Wolfmuller was the world's first production motorcycle. Heinrich and Wilhelm Hildebrand were steam engine, en I'm sorry, steam engine engineers before they teamed up with Aloy Wolfmuller to produce the internal combustion bike in 1894. Approximately 2,000 units were built, uh, but with a high initial purchase price and fierce competition from improving designs, it was not thought to have been a great commercial success. Uh, this model was uh, entire, entirely run and jump. Uh, requiring neither clutch nor pedals. Now, Tony, I would, I would love to see some run and jump racing. Is that, <laughs> is that, does that exist? Where so I it actually is. There's a little amateur organization called ARMA, and they ha I cannot remember what it is, but you have a person from your team. They hold the bike on the other side. It's uh, the Le Mans race, mm -hmm. like they do with the cars. Yeah, yeah. They park all the bikes across, and the, the racers are on the other side. And as soon as the green flag goes, they have to run over there, start their bikes, and go. Like bobsledders, almost. Yes. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> well, that's pretty. It'll give you a good. Hmm. You yeah. can watch a couple of them trample. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Question number six. How are we doing, Joe? Who's a. Uh... You don't want to know. Okay. <laughs> Jake still has a chance. That's right. <laughs> oh, <he doesn't. laughs> Question six. Uh, finish the following 1962 motorcycle advertising slogan. You meet the nicest people on a blank. Was it A, Ducati? B, the Harley Davidson, or was it C, Honda? I'll go first on this one because you've been going first. Go ahead. I'm going to try Ducati because Harley, I think they were the muscle back <laughs> they then. They were the muscle back then. Yeah. If you're going to go A, I'm going to go C. C? The answer C, Honda. Whew. Here He's we go. A comeback. Yeah. <laughs> You meet the nicest people on a Honda is perhaps the most iconic motorcycle sales slogan ever created. And it is certainly uh, among the most effective. Sales of all motorcycles imported to America in 1959 accounted for approximately 6,300 units. That same year, Honda Motor Company founded its US distributorship, American Honda, in Los Angeles. By the end of 1963, uh, the first full year that the nicest people ad appeared in magazines and newspapers across America, total motorcycle sales in the U.S. had soared to about 148,000 units. Uh, have it, any of you ever owned a Honda? Yeah, I yeah. dirt bikes. Yeah, really? No oh, shadow. I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> um, question seven. Which model by Harley-Davidson celebrated its 30th anniversary in 2020? Was it A, the Fat Boy, B, the Fat Bob, or was it C, the Road Glide? Uh, I know you know Harley, so I'm going first, so I can't change. Go ahead. Like, I'm going to go with Road Glide. And, like, this is the most confident I've been, and I'm, like, at 8%. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm not going to lie. I've only owned Electric Glide, so uh -oh. um, I went at the uh, 30th anniversary, and 30 years ain't that I'm going to say B, Fat Bob. That's like a newer one, I think. Answer, A, the Fat Boy. Oh, <laughs> what? I, th I thought Fat Boy was like their oldest model. <laughs> After three decades of near consistent popularity and a design that somehow seemed to capture the essence of the 2000s, Harley-Davidson has given the iconic Fat Boy a celebratory shout-out in the form of a special edition. Say hello to the mid-year 2020 Fat Boy 30th anniversary model, hmm. which celebrates the original with a preponderance of black finishes a serial number plate on each unit, and a single color option, black. <laughs> At the bottom of the seventh, uh, the score is three to two. Three to Oof. two. Yes. Who's in the lead? Tony. Tony. Oh. Tony. Well, there's still time. Yeah, there is. <laughs> Question number eight. According to the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety, motorcycle anti-lock braking systems have shown to reduce fatal crashes by about how much? Was it A, 22%, B, 33%, or C, 40%. Well, I actually conducted this study. Oh, you did? did no, I'm no joking. Idea. Um, <laughs> I had no idea. I'm going to say A. A. Jeez, yeah. I think they'll want to pump their numbers. I'll go with C. C? Mm. Answer. A, 22%. Oh, it's tied up. Oh, boy. <laughs> ABS, ABS prevents, prevents wheels from locking up. And that's a crucial uh, aspect on a motorcycle. On a car, a lockup might result in a skid. On a motorcycle, it often means a serious fall. The rate of fatal crashes is 22% lower for motorcycles equipped with the optional anti-lock brakes. Uh, 
than for the same models without them. I would just like to say real quick, like that ABS, when we go through that course, we'll get that bike up to 60 miles an hour. And it was always like a thing when we were younger, don't slam on that brake, you'll go over the handlebars. Yeah. With, with ABS, how far it's come, we'll take those motorcycles and those electric lines weigh 780 some pounds. Mm -hmm. And then we were going like 60 and you grab that brake as hard as you can. And it is amazing how that bike just comes to a stop on its own, just like your car. Wow. And yeah. it, so don't ever, if you ever hear you're gonna go over the handlebars, you will not. Wow, nice. You gotta really believe, man. Eh? Oh, you have to believe <laughs> to grab onto that. Question number nine. Which of the following features in motorcycles is restricted in some countries around the world? Is it A, sidecars, B, rear seats, or is it C, subframes? Oh. Hmm. What do you think, yeah. Jake? Uh, I don't, you know, I'm just going to look foolish. I don't know. Uh, I'm going to say C. We're past that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So there's. I don't think it is, but I'm, I'm going to go with uh, rear seats. The answer. B, rear seats. Well, that, I, well, I, I, thought, you know, I thought about it, but... Pillion riding, as it's called, is associated with terrorist or criminal attacks in some South Asian countries. In Pakistan, for instance, pillion riding is often banned by local authorities around sensitive times when there have been violent attacks on worshippers. In the Philippines, where policemen... Sorry, in the Philippines, where policemen are already routinely checking motorcycles, uh, in response to increased incidents of crimes, such as murder and robbery, committing using a motorcycle, some cities are already considering a ban on pillion riding, known as riding in tandem, right? Uh, some countries, I'm sorry, some cities have already enforced a ban on pillion riding unless the driver and passenger are married or biologically related. Now, Jake, um, I think some of us are dying to know uh, whether or not you've uh, taken any pillion passengers, passengers along on on, uh, on the back of your bike in the performance of your du in the performance of your duties. Uh, no, no. It, it only allows one seat. Any any perps? No perps. No. I think they would frown upon it just having someone lay across the back. Yeah, I guess. Right. <laughs> the last Cut question. them to the rear wheel. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> question ten. Our last question. How far is the longest backwards motorcycle ride achieved by an Indian rider? This is this is a gentleman from India in 2014. Was it A, about six miles, B, about 43 miles, or was it C, about 125 miles? Does it say what kind of bike? It does not. Because we go by fuel mileage. Well, yeah, you could. <laughs> yeah, fuel, yeah, I mean, well, go ahead, Tony, I'll let you get this one. Uh, I'm going big, uh, C. I got small bikes over there, I'm gonna go B. B, the answer, C. Of course. 125 ah. miles. <laughs> According to the Guinness Book of, uh, Book of World Records, the longest backward motorcycle ride is 202 kilometers, or about 125 miles. And it was achieved by a Dippian Shooteri in Jablapur, India. I'm sorry, that's his name. <laughs> On 7 October 2014, Dippian is a Lance Hildevar and is part of Daredevils, the Indian Army Corps of Signals motorcycle display team. All right, Joe. Man, did I learn a lot. Yes. <laughs> yes. There are no losers here today, Lance. Oh, okay. <laughs> <clears throat> well, I'd like to extend a huge thank you to our guests, uh, Tony, Jake, uh, Todd as well. Thank you for joining us for this year's brief. It's been fun. Uh, you guys were awesome. Any parting shots at all? Uh, I, I honestly just want to bang on the drum about reaching out and asking for a mentor. Yeah. Don't, don't be the tough guy, tough email. Ask a question. You know, there's no dumb questions, whatever. It, just just ask for help. Yeah. It, it, it could save your life. It could save your passenger's life. So just ask. Yeah. Thanks for that. Just please ride safe. Yeah. That's all I can say. You know, it might be cliche, but speed kills. And you got to remember, if you get in an accident, it's not just affecting your life. It affects your families. It affects the person that got hit. It affects everybody's. It's not just you. Yeah. <clears throat> Well, thank you. Special thanks to the 127th Wing Public Affairs Office. We absolutely could not have done this without you. Uh, for those that so desire to continue listening, Chaplain Pitt will join us immediately following uh, for this year's Blessing of the Bikes. Again, that's an annual tradition in some areas where riders can join the chaplain and an invocation for safety for the, for the coming reason. I'm sorry, coming season. 
Uh, and, and thank you to those that listened. Be devoted, be deliberate, be discernible this year. Um, please review your must account and, uh, and where you're at on the training continuum. Uh, and please don't forget to, to try mentorship this year. Thank you. To all the most cycle riders in 2023, my name is Chaplain Cortland Pitt from the 127th Wing. I am wishing everyone a safe season. Someone said, when riding a motorcycle, no one ever asks, are we there yet? So please allow me to say a brief prayer and ask for God to cover us as we ride this season. Father, you are great and mighty. You are the creator of everything. And so, Father, we ask that you just cover us as we ride. We thank you for the opportunity to get on our bikes again this season. We ask, Father, that you will protect us, keep us from all harm, be with us as we travel the highways throughout the streets of the city. We pray, Father, that we will be alert. Our eyes will be keen to every uh, uneven roads. We pray, oh God, that you will just bless us. We pray for a season of laughter, fulfillment, enjoyment. And we ask these blessings. In your name we pray. Amen.